Hello again. In this lecture dedicated for master students, we shall offer an easy informative entry into post-colonial theories. This lecture is about subalternity by Gayatri Spivak. In her influential and controversial essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? later expanded into her book, Critique of Post-Colonial Reason, Spivak addresses precisely the issue of whether people in subordinate, colonized positions are able to achieve a voice. A subaltern refers to an officer in a subordinate position. The term was used by the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci to refer to the working masses that needed to be organized by left-wing intellectuals into a politically self-conscious force. So, the term, as Spivak uses it, also in an attempt to articulate and give a voice to the struggles of the oppressed peasants in the Indian subcontinent. Spivak therefore borrows the term subaltern from Gramsci to refer to the unrepresented group of people in a given society. Her critical discourse raises the issues of marginal subjects who live on the periphery, such as the place of the subaltern women in the society and their empowerment. Though the people could surpass the colonial rule, they are not actually free from its influences, its power structures and legacy. Stephen Morton, a post-colonial theorist, says that the social, political and economic structures that were established during colonial rule continue to inflect the cultural, political, and economic life of post-colonial nations. States ranging from Ireland to Algeria, from India to Pakistan, and from Jamaica to Mexico. So, it is hard or often impossible to define a subaltern. This individual who lives on the periphery, who is marginalized, oppressed. So we may say that uh, subaltern individuals are those resting outside of the political and social economic power. As Spivak puts it, he is a non-specialist, non-academic, including illiterate peasantry, aboriginals, and the lowest strata of the urban sub proletariat. In the Indian context, the country is a land of varieties and vitalities. It is divided into different states in the name of class, religion, language, ethnicity, gender, and citizenship. In this scattered outlook, the condition of the subaltern is all of the more pathetic. Spivak came to the forefront of the literary circle with her celebrated essay to vindicate the apprehension of women in India who practice the widow sacrifice known as sati. The practice of sati in the pre-independent India was considered as part of a barbaric culture by the Western world. In fact, this practice recalled uh, some stories about the Vikings in Europe. The Vikings also used to burn their nobles, their kings and princes, and they chose a slave woman to be burnt with him. So even Europe was a dark place before, and they used to practice such uh, barbaric practices. So the abolition of 
these Hindu rights by the British was understood as white men saving brown women from brown men. This phrase is used by Spivak in her essay to highlight the role of the British colonizers in abolishing the practice of sati in colonial India. Therefore, in a patriarchal society, men would make all the decisions for women. Not that very much has changed, brown or white. The essay was written by Spivak to highlight how subalterns who are the oppressed of the oppressed are never represented and never get their voice heard, so they are voiceless. To support her theory, Spivak used the practice of sati where the women performing sati is the subaltern woman, whose voice is never heard whether she wishes to practice or not. In short, brown and white men were making and imposing decisions on women. Within this context, through Gayatri Spivak's concept of the subaltern, as rural postcolonial woman, subalternity becomes a condition of speechlessness. So, symbolically, we might say that the colonizer is the self, the colonized is the other, and all those who are invisible to both self and other are the subaltern. The essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? Well, it asks a question. The answer to the title of her essay is no. The subaltern does not have a voice. He cannot speak. Indeed, technically, once a subaltern has a voice, they are no longer the subaltern. They become the other, merely altern. As Spivak says in her interview, if the subaltern can speak, then Thank God, the subaltern is not a subaltern anymore. In a nutshell, by subaltern, Spivak means the oppressed subjects, or more generally, those of inferior rank. She goes on to add that in the context of colonial production, the subaltern has no history and cannot speak, the subaltern as female is even more deeply in the shadow. So this table presents some formation of subaltern groups. So according to different social formations, we, well, the subaltern changes. So if we are talking about class, the subaltern is the working classes, the proletariat. The dominant group in such case is the bourgeois. So if, for instance, the social formation we are talking about is the empire, the subaltern in that case are the natives, and the dominant group are the Europeans. So, when we change the social formation, the subaltern also changes. It could be women versus men, minorities versus the majority, and so on and so forth. Practice. Task one. Students have to read uh, Asia Jabbar, L'amour, la fantasia. Not all of it, but just one chapter. My father writes to my mother. Then they have to answer the questions below. 
The chapter depicts subjugation and subalternity of Algerian women during the colonial era. How? So I want students to answer how this chapter depicts subalternity. Second question. What does the postcard symbolize? Next, how learning how to write in French language liberates the mother in the eyes of her daughter? How language destroys subalternity? Last question. Do you know any similar situations where subaltern women are nameless and speechless, as in the story given by Asya Jabbar? Task 2. We are going to read Amaata Idols, short story Certain Winds from the South, then answer the questions. First one, how does Hawa in the story presents a condition of speechlessness, although she is the main character? Second question, when do you think can Hawa escape her subaltern status? When do you think she can be represented and get her voice heard? I hope this course was clear. See you next time. Thank you.